And we are live! Greetings and salutations, my beautiful beans, and welcome! Did I get you the best guests? Of course! I got you the best guests. Today I have Rune Smith, uh, also known as Logan Reese, and Ben Byrne from Ghostfire Gaming. Guys, how are you doing? Fantastic. I'm purple. Well, I'm, I'm awake. I'm here. I'm, I've made it. Ben, <laughs> from the land down under. <laughs> Why don't you share with the nice beans at home, Ben, what exactly disgusting time I have dragged you onto the live stream? What Look, time is not... it where you are right now? It's not too bad. It's 6 a.m. So like on a normal day, I'd probably be awake, um, you know, about this time. But it is also Sunday. So I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry for your loss. <laughs> and thank you so very much for joining us here today. And of course, Logan is at, is, is at a much more reasonable time today, aren't you, Logan? Yeah, absolutely. It's like 11. So, you know, that somehow woke up at like 6 or like 5.30. And <laughs> you, you, you got Ben vibes. You got Ben yeah. vibes. You work together too much. <laughs> We're on the same the same biorhythm, just completely different time zones. Yeah, exactly. Rugrat says you're from the future, Ben. Well, I hope I it's going well. <laughs> Cross fingers, everything pans out. It, it looks. It seems okay so far. It seems okay so far. So far, so good. So far, so good. <laughs> it's what we like. All right, Beans. Today we are talking about, of course. What else than taverns? Because we're running our tavern challenge right now. I'm sure the link for that will be thrown in the chat in just a few. But um, before we talk about what we are talking about, let's talk about who we are talking about it with. Logan Reese, also known as Runesmith, is an author and YouTuber who mainly covers 5th edition D&D content. It's best known for his Basically series that explores monsters and other topics, as well as his two currently published books soon to be three i think logan very exciting very right exciting oh yeah he's also worked alongside both games Fire gaming and world anvil that us in the past logan give us the elevator pitch what's coming up what's the new book tell us everything oh well sunken isles is a massive adventure that uh just like seeker's guide was way too much of a project to take on um we uh, but you did it anyway because yeah, you're the, awesome the, the elevator pitch is a mix of Norse, Hawaiian, and Eldritch mythology that takes you from level 1 to 20 with a bunch of different branch branching paths and these unique locations scattered all over the ocean. Incredible. Norse, Hawaiian, and Eldritch. Eldritch. Lovecraftian, you could say. I love it. Viking Hawaiians with tentacles. <laughs> I need to know more about this book. That's all I can say. <laughs> I know that you'll be giving us a little bit more later. And of course, Ben, whose love of tabletop games has grown from his passion of performing and storytelling. Ben, uh, before Ben was the media content uh, manager of Ghostfire Gaming, he worked as an actor, a podcaster, and a freelance writer. No, that one didn't work. He preferred writing style for his preferred style for running CTRPGs is to craft theatrical and immersive role playing experiences that allow players to express themselves and feel emotionally connected to the world everyone is taking a part of creating. What's your top tip for that, Ben? If, if you were to give just one, um, uh, create NPCs that feel real uh, rather than sort of like boffins that the characters can bounce off of. Uh, give them something to care about with the with the NPCs and the world which they inhabit. Oh, I love that. Real people, not straw people. Mm, mm, exactly. Fantastic. Top tip. And uh, that is the perfect time for me to mention, speaking of NPCs, our Eldritch Foundry mini raffle, which is going on right now, or will be soon, exclamation point raffle to take part in that. And you, yes, you, can win one of the fantastic Eldritch Foundry miniature figurines that you can customize yourself and will be sent to your very door. Your very door. But I think it's time to talk taverns. And my first question is basically, why are they so important? Everyone talks about taverns. You wrote an entire freaking book <laughs> about taverns. Why taverns? Why are they so important in RPG games and even in other stories as well? Well, just the baseline of it, it is a boiling pot of diversity. You know, it's, it's a location that people go to to meet other people, to meet interesting people. And that's always what starts an adventure is someone you don't know doing something you don't know that you're curious about, you're craving that that strangeness, and that's what starts the hero's journey. So to come somewhere where people are either halfway through their journey, just starting one or at the end of one and relaxing is just such an exciting and diverse place to be in in an adventure. I love mm. that. Ben, anything mm. to add? 
Uh, I think you hit it pretty pretty well there, but they're they're social spaces, and so that's why they make so much sense at the start of a game is because it's it's the easiest kind of place to explain why these you know three to six to seven diverse different Stranger. characters who may be meeting for the first time kind of happen to run across each other is you know they yeah it could be a way house uh you know between towns it doesn't even have to be in a town necessarily so they could all be on a journey in different directions but for whatever reason their their paths align here in the tap pardon me in the tavern so i love that i really love that now um twisted taverns obviously the book has such a, a variety of different taverns, different different feeling taverns. Um, where do you start with your own tavern concept? Oh, you got the fancy one. I got both. Right there in my I got the so muggle one. one. <laughs> so where do you start when you're creating the concepts for these spaces? Oh, that is an interesting question. Um, all of them are basically pulled from really simple elements that I try to flesh out by just picking and pulling chunks from inspiration or natural concepts or these abstract concepts and maybe inspired characters or just like life stories and stuff. And I just throw them all in a pot. I put the lid on it and I just let it boil. But it, it really does start with just what like a mushroom tavern. That was the mm -hmm. initial idea for the fungal grotto, which is one of the most ridiculous abstract taverns it has like super mario references it has alice in wonderland references um <laughs> but yeah it starts with just oh i really like mycology this book is about taverns let's just do both i love that so for our beans at home who of course are all creating taverns right now for our for our competition would you say that um that starting with something like that, a, a seed of an idea a germ of a, of a high concept even if it seems a little bit wacky that would be where you would recommend that's how life starts <laughs> it's just with one little nugget it starts multiplying one little nugget and a lot of yeah. wackiness poetic <laughs> i like that how about you ben yeah i think that uh you know I, I haven't written a book on tavern so i haven't had to think quite as high concept um as logan has before but when i'm creating a tavern for a game that i'm going to be running generally i'm thinking what sort of um what sort of NPCs are going to be hanging out here? Like if I need somewhere for a quest giver to exist or an NPC that they've met earlier says, meet me in this town, what sort of establishment are they going to hang out at? Are they going to be at a cocktail bar that also happens to sell potions? Are they going to be at a, you know, fine dining uh, restaurant hotel? I think uh, getting stuck in thinking of the tavern as this sort of wooden, oaky, smoky, um, boardroom where everybody sits around boarding house room I should say where everybody kind of sits around drinking ale mugs is a bit of a trap to fall into and thinking of all the uh, you know diverse kind of different places what kind of clientele is your tavern trying to attract is it trying to attract the lords and ladies of the land or the fish people from under the sea you know yeah um, I really like uh, that idea that you're you're presenting essentially that you start with an NPC and then you build the tavern as an extension of their personality Sure. Like yeah, this yeah. is where this type of person would go. And then you start putting ideas in that. That's really cool. Yeah. It's basically, yeah, it's absolutely. customer segmentation, but in taverns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> where would they want to hang out and put right. them there? I love I that. think it's always like larger cities as well. I always like to have at least two taverns because A, I feel like, you know, most towns tend to have more than one pub or restaurant. I don't know if that's medievally accurate, but uh, <laughs> it also gives you an option when the party are like, all right, we're going to go like rest or, you know, stock up on, on food or whatever. You're like, well, do you want to go to the high fancy place or do you want to go hang out with the scum of the earth? Like, which would you <laughs> pick your poison? Maybe literally. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Demetrius has just thrown a tip in the chat, which is essentially those of you who took part in the bard challenge, you might want to use your end, your bard as the NPC. Where would this bard perform? There you go. And that could be a good start for your tavern as well. So we've got an idea of high concept. We've got an idea of basing it around essentially where, where, who hangs out here? Like what, what kind of space am I creating a luxurious space or am I creating like the dodgy tavern on the docks, right? Like these are, these are the, the kinds of questions that we can start to ask when we're beginning our journey of creating a tavern. So I think, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think also thinking about maybe what the needs of the town are. Uh, I had a tavern, which again, it wasn't anything crazy or, or particularly special, like what was in Twisted Taverns. But the idea was that it was adjacent to a bard college. And so all the, all the musical theater students who were practicing to become bards 
would go and perform at the tavern across the street. And so it was kind of like a uni bar or a college bar hangout. Um, so just thinking about like, what, what does the village need? What is this village about? Is it, is it, is it, is there a wizard college here? And all the wizards go here and hypothesize about their, their arcane law that they're thinking about. It's like an extension of the library and it's just filled with yeah. students writing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I That's feel horrible. like the, the, um, the musical theater place is autobiographical for you, Ben. Is that true? <laughs> Uh, yeah, a little bit, totally. Especially when I when I ran it one one time, and I was like, "You guys come in, and it's across the road from the Bard College." And somebody went, uh, "Student theatre." All right, let's go find the other tavern. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, ouch!" <laughs> My heart, <laughs> my heart was stab. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love this. So we have our concept. We know a little bit about the kind of space that we want to create. What comes next? What are the important bases to cover when you're making a tavern? That's an interesting question. I think uh, it really comes down to the writer's perspective of what is go the next most important thing. And I think for me, it's kind of the the facilities and the types of rooms that this tavern might have. It's like if a lot of people are traveling through here, does it have like a lot of in space? Are there a lot of segmented rooms? If it's somewhere that nobles or criminals come, they need a lot of private rooms for people to talk that are soundproofed. And you go from there and then i think after that step you can kind of for me ask the question okay who's here now that like what kind of person does this place facilitate so i kind of do it backwards sure how about you ben um yeah i think it's i mean taverns really what they the function that they serve in a lot of DD campaigns and i don't think this is the function they have to serve but um, you know, they are the place where you gather rumors and you gather quests. So I think once I've established the sort of tavern that it is, I'm thinking about like, what quests are the party going to learn about here? What sort of things are the folks in this tavern talking about? And as I mentioned before, I might add more than one tavern to a certain location if I think the town is big enough. So I will, you know, one one tavern might be talking about all the arcane things that are happening in the village something got stolen from this arcane college and all the wizards are talking about how it needs to be found soon and it's such a calamity if you go to the more criminally inclined tavern in town they're all talking about oh, did you hear something got stolen from the uh, wizards yeah it's, such and such might have it because they're looking for a buyer for some special item that they have so sort of flavoring them slightly differently depending on the clientele uh, i think is um, useful. I've also started like something that I've started doing a lot because party members seem to get a bit stuck sometimes in taverns. You can a make your NPCs really interesting and sort of say like, all right, when you walk in, these are the first two, three people that you notice. There's a guy sitting over here who looks like he's being bodyguarded and nobody is allowed to get close to him. And this dude over here looks particularly down on his luck. Who do you want to go question? But the, uh, the other thing I, that I've been doing a lot is just adding bounty boards and just being like, you see the bounty board so that players go, oh, okay, I need quest. Let's go over there and, and read all the bounties. That is a much better answer. And I think you kind of covered um, the idea of introducing a space as unique where you start with what are the sounds? What are people mm. talking about? What am I hearing? And then what am I seeing when I walk in? So if you mm. cover the rest of it, like what does it feel like? Maybe does it smell like moldy and dingy or does it smell mm. like iron? Like maybe a lot of blood passes through here. Mm. So that's a lot of interesting questions to answer. Do, do the party feel welcome when they walk in? Is this a tavern where they want to hang out because it's, you know, everybody's just having a drink and a laugh? Or is this a tavern that feels very clicky when you walk in and, you know, there's smoke hanging in the air and there's music playing and everybody's paying close attention to the music, but it stops dead the moment the door kind of creaks in. You know, you can set a lot of atmosphere mm -hmm. with your tavern. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know about you guys, but I feel like tavern quest boards have got really big sit um and, and way bigger as like video games have got bigger. Oh, like yeah. it's yeah, it's totally. something that people more expect. Like mm -hmm. having played Witcher, for example, Witcher yeah, 3, yeah, yeah. <laughs> running around and reading all the tavern boards. Um I just I feel like I feel more like that's become part of the expected experience of players as well. Sure. which is really interesting seeing how that genre is sort of bleeding into into the, the role-playing games genre as well i think the it's thing a lot with it, just, the, like, sorry go ahead Logan. you allocate information you collect it all to a very digestible mm. simplified like okay these are the options if you want to learn more go Absolutely. there instead of presenting like ben was saying a bunch of people 
who are the same thing as a quest board. You can see mm. their problems on their faces, but making <laughs> it text is just easier. As, as Ben said very astutely, sometimes players just struggle. They, yes. you know, I think depending on how experienced your players are and what kind of players, like I'm a drama yeah, queen at the fun. table. There's a reason that I do a lot of stream games. <laughs> I love talking to NPCs, but some players are really in it to, to just mash things. And the idea mm. of talking to an NPC and trying to get information out of them is is a lot more work than just you see a tavern board. Yes. Yoink. Mm. <laughs> you can still be creative as well. Um, those that know me are going to be surprised that I wasn't the first one to bring up the Witcher, but I think you're right is that um, there's... Uh, you can add a lot of flavor to a tavern or to a town or to a place with the tavern board by not just saying like, there's some ghosts in a graveyard, go kill them. Yeah. Um, and I'll pay you some coin, but being like, you know, hark dear folk of this village. Uh, I have heard screams most terrible, you know, and that can all be yeah. written like down because somebody's, um, you know, looking for, for mighty adventurers, or it could be something as simple as like, need a hunter trapper someone who's good at killing animals yeah. will pay x amount of gold and then that evolves out into oh this person's got like a real monster problem they just don't realize it yet um so you can add a lot of you know flavor and community vibe through the the text of your uh, notice board as well it doesn't just have to be x quest x reward I feel yeah like absolutely i love going missing is just the perfect rabbit hole yeah <laughs> I've, I've done this with with that. goblins yeah. before um, that's how Dimmy ended up with Goblin Ward. Just saying. Uh, <laughs> that's another story. Um, but I love the idea that you mentioned as well, that like you can just allude to the quest. It doesn't have to be there are ghosts in the mm -hmm. graveyard. It can be whoever's having parties and leaving sticky <laughs> things and yelling in the middle of the night or in the graveyard, ectoplasm. cut it out, and then you go there and it's full of exactly ectoplasm and screaming, <laughs> right? Well, um, yeah, just, exactly. Like speaking of the Witcher, I love the idea that like, you know, the, the common folk don't understand what it is they're witnessing. So quite often when they lay down a quest line and you start pulling at the thread, it's either much bigger than they initially described or it's something, you know, completely different. I think there's a quest in the Witcher where a guy says there's a dragon over by the hill and you go there and it's not at all a dragon. It's just like a wyvern and you kill it and whatever. And yeah. uh, you kind of fix the problem because you're the expert. But um yeah, Some villages we do adventures where <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Huge, like there's like 17 dragons and it's just one guy <laughs> casting some spells. It's just a kid with a big stick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, that's what all of all of our players are too. We can't complain too yeah. much. <laughs> okay, awesome. So we've created our concept. We've created the kind of space we want, and we've covered the bases. What are the most common mistakes that you see at this point? What do people forget, or or what other kinds of mistakes do you see in taverns? I'm not going to make you name any names. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know that there's a lot of mistakes you can make with a tavern, to be honest. Like there's never there's never a game that I've uh, run or been in where I've thought like, ooh, that that was, you know, awkward or really didn't work. Uh, but Logan, you look like you might have thought of something. Yeah, I am uh, an ever vigilant en enemy of expectation. And I sure. think when writing these, the worst thing you can do for yourself is writing too much, mm. is fleshing out all these different concepts. Like I made that mistake uh, with one of my first locations where I had this big city and I had like political intrigue. I had a guy who wants to go fishing and then they left. Mm. And that made me very <laughs> mad. So don't, don't expect your players to take all of the bait, to go after all these things that might be red herrings or might be amazing adventures, because sometimes they'll just do whatever they want. That's kind of yeah. how they, they want to play the game. So plan for that by not planning for it, I think. If you, if you throw in a, an NPC to a tavern, like, you know, sometimes you have players that walk in and they're like, you know, who's the first person I see? Um, and you describe, you know, X, Y, Z person, usually one of those I like to leave as like, give them a description. It's a, it's the barmaid. You see her talking to people as she walks by, people seem to like her a lot, but she doesn't have a set function quest speaking. Uh, she doesn't have a set quest that's tied to her, but she's kind of the person who I'll bring up when the party just like, oh, I pick a random NPC and start talking to them so that you've got like a little bit of room, especially if you're a DM that struggles to think of like names or descriptions off the top of your head, uh, just having kind of like a blank NPC in your back pocket can be useful. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think on that, like, and this is a little bit from my, I do, I do two things. I, I write gaming books and I write novels, right? So this is a little mm. bit from, from my, my novel pocket that I'm bringing out. But if you introduce the NPC, they are important. Yes. Sure. Like if you, say. if the players go, who's the first NPC I see? Well, it's, it's freaking Strider, isn't it? It's Aragorn <laughs> sitting there in a cloak being broody. That's the first NPC you see, because do you know what? Like the players are there to engage with the quest. The players are there to have fun. And while it's, it's, you know, either it's an NPC that you choose, who's like, this is a lot of fun and they will love this NPC and they have the secret that I will hint very heavily and maybe they'll pick it up or it's mm -hmm. Aragorn because here is the, here is the quest. It's here. Please take it. Please take the plot, <laughs> players. Please. Um, and again, when you're a, when you're a novelist, you don't have this problem because you control the main yes. characters, so you can make them take the quest. But mm. um, still, like presenting the quest in front of them when they say, "I talked to a random NPC," it closes some loops. Like it, it saves some time if really that's the only function of the tavern that you've created. I was actually mm -hmm. going to say that making a blank out of pocket NPC is a big risk if you are a nervous DM and that is trampling over your ability to improvise. This character quickly starts to represent kind of your style of DMing. So if you don't have any ideas prepared or like on a note or a table, you can kind of lose yourself and just get really confused. So I think just to have like either to present everything directly or to have a bunch of ideas in the background that you can pull out of pocket in addition to just this person. So this is, uh, Dimi and I have this agile world building method, and this is one of the things we talk about, is essentially having a little list of just some names, mm -hmm. and some names that maybe have a little bit of characteristic in them, like, I don't know, Sapphire Feychild is a very different <laughs> character to Grawn the Masher, right? So you could just have a couple of these different names and pull one out and throw it in. Um, and if the name gives you a little bit of extra characterization yeah. already, that's very useful because it's something that the players can quickly latch onto. And whenever they think of that character, they'll be like, oh, yes, Sapphire Feychild. I remember her. Or, oh, yes, Grawn the Masher, the one that smashed my tankard. I remember him. <laughs> yeah, even if it is silly or simple, that can lead to a lot of things. Like if you have a character named Nine, yeah. there's a lot behind that that the players are going to want to know, even if it's just the simplest thing that you pulled out. It's like, well, oh why are you numbered yeah. where are the others kind of thing <laughs> yeah what happened to one through eight <laughs> mm -hmm. um yeah I'm absolutely surprised nine's the one that survived <laughs> yeah, it's a weird movie yeah yeah <laughs> but um yeah i think having having little prep like that just like a quick list of names that you can cross off if you are a nervous gm it makes your life so much easier just a mm. little bit of prep and again all you need to do next time is just refresh the name list like mm. <laughs> grab a random name generator if you need to, whatever. But at least then you have something. And we had this running joke in a game that I was playing that um, we had Boris, Scoris, and Doris, and all of the NPCs had these kinds of names. And it was quite a serious campaign. But the minute all the NPCs were called Boris, Scoris, and Doris, shockingly, it lost a little bit of that serious tone. Um, sure. And I, yeah, I think like as a GM finding ways to keep the kind of story that you want to tell is is what it's about right yeah totally I, I've, I've definitely had that experience as well where i'm generally pretty good at coming up with npc names off the top of my head so i don't write that list down although i probably should start because every now and again it'll be like oh what's this person called and i'll be like Argon. Argon. Argon is their name. Or the uh, ever famous among my my home group, uh, Justin the Pirate, because they're in this pirate town and they're like, what's this guy's name? And I'm like, Justin. And they He's thought it was the least the piratey. Port. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, uh, I love that. that. There's Go a ahead. million resources out there. There's like, oh, yeah. we're saying that this is important. And there's proof that if you look up random name generators, there's a million of them because it's something that people need. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Absolutely. And I will say that if you've got really wacky naming conventions or specific naming conventions, I'm thinking of you and McCaffrey with your flowers and fnors. I'm thinking of, you know, uh, any, yeah. any, you know, tabaxis, for example, that have this sort of very unique, not tabaxi, sorry, um, Skyrim, cat people. Uh, Khajiit. Kajit, oh, yeah, Kajit, thank you so much. The Kajit that have this very specific naming conventions, mm -hmm. for example, and you need something characteristic, you can make your own generator. Just mm -hmm. saying, you can do it at World Anvil, but you can do it somewhere else as well. <laughs> like, but do do prep. 
do prep these names if you need something specific because it will help you and it will stop your pirates being called Justin or Boris, Goris, <laughs> and Doris. And yeah, I mean, or, or like every NPC is called Brad. I've seen this as well. Like, it, <laughs> it's not ideal, you know, right? The, the, the other thing I get is uh, somebody noted at one point during my campaigns that every male NPC looked like Henry Cavill just because I got into the habit of like just going like, you know, he's kind of chiseled. He's kind of strong jawed. He kind of looks like Henry Cavill. And somebody goes, doesn't everyone in this world look like Henry Cavill? Strong jeans. Strong jeans. The obsession. Mongols were Henry Cavill. This is. Yeah, this is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Genghis Khan looked like Henry Cavill. Cavill. that's what happened right yeah. yes this is what i believe but this is great because we've been talking about names how do you come up with good D D tavern names uh, what makes it what makes a good name what makes a memorable name what makes a, an evocative name naming conventions really easily it's just like word association it's the mm -hmm. adjective noun that's the easiest one it's the most common you can also um one thing that i like to do is look around like your hometown and look at um, all the naming conventions that are local. And then I've found that because I moved from a valley farm town to a logging town, there's a place called like everything's based on milling or like mm. logs or wood. And then if you go to the farm town, it's all about like, you know, walnut or like acres and these silly things. So I think uh, an effective naming convention is to base it kind of on the history of the town to have it kind of hint at its own creation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, you know, you can come up with fun pun names and I have a, a friend of mine who, um, you know, spends his time when he's on the train, just thinking of tavern names because he likes to think of, you know, fun puns or, or different things yeah, that um, puns are good. Puns you make are great. him giggle or make the, the players giggle. Um, I also think, you know, much like Logan said, reflecting the, the town, um, the location, um, is it going yeah. to have a, a really fun, interesting name? Um, and what's the tavern like, you know? So two two taverns in a city that I once had the the student theatre was called the the Barefaced Liar, L Y R E, um, which I always oh. had to to clarify, so funny. Um, which people That's enjoyed. Uh, but then the low lower class kind of like thieves guild style tavern was just called the Broken Leg um, <laughs> because it wasn't clever, didn't need to be. I think I, it might have it's even still, been something no. that I came up off the car. I think it's clever. clever. Yeah, it's but, like, uh, it's what you tone. get if you don't belong there. I think it worked well, great. Yeah, well, exactly. Exactly <laughs> that. And leg. people remembered, like, oh, the yeah. broken leg, that's where you go. But there's also, like, if it's just a way stop, if it's a village that, like, you know, they don't even really have a tavern, they don't really have that sort of commerce because they don't have a need for it for whatever reason, maybe they're in the shadow of a much larger settlement, it's just the log hall. It's just where they hang out. Like it's, you know, it's not a shop or anything like, yeah, sure. You can get food there and maybe make a donation, but it doesn't, you know, need a, a fancy name. So mm -hmm. thinking about, um, you know, the sort of people and the, the, the location of the tavern can help generate the name. Mm -hmm. I actually have a really good tip for this, oh, which yeah. is if you have an NPC, particularly a Royal NPC that you need to foreshadow later, make it like the crown prince's arms. Or something and then when you meet yeah. the crown prince later everyone's going to be like oh oh the guy oh. with the tavern oh oh you're a genius and you're like no i just named a tavern because i knew he was coming <laughs> he named the tavern um, yeah exactly yeah. so in in the uk it's really common because uh monarchy uh yeah, you get yeah, a lot so. of these kinds of things like you know the crown prince's arms or the <laughs> royal arms or you know the royal crown this kind of stuff yeah. you get a lot of taverns that are named like this or after heraldry so you get things like yeah. the red lion um or yeah. the green dragon this kind of thing so this is another really nice place that you can jump into or if you want to make your important npc your bar owner name it after something about the bar owner okay I, thank you so much for bringing it back to that i thought i had lost my place i wanted to say this but that is a perfect lead-in um my favorite tavern in the seeker's guide to twisted taverns is um <laughs> poor larry's ah. and it's not it's not called poor larry's it's larry's but if you look closely at the sign on the front it actually says lucky larry's and sons but the lucky has been or overgrown by plants and the and sons has been faded away and scratched out because they don't work there anymore Aww. so people call it poor larry's that is so mm. sad it's very sad but yeah you can do this um i had a I had a tavern that was called the mermaid because it was named after a guy's wife and the wife died. And then he, um, 
he refashioned the thing so he added like a second mermaid that was with the face of his daughter to the sign um and it was like right. this whole sort of little family story that's very very small it's very insignificant in a lot of ways but you know if it's something that is very meaningful to that npc and if the players ask about it oh who's the mermaid you know they'll they'll get a whole story and they might get secrets and quests out of it as well Bring and it. all yeah, you I need mean... to do is be like okay dude wife died daughter <laughs> yeah. that's it that's like that's yeah. the amount of planning that goes into that that's th like three bullet points if you're generous for sure i mean you definitely um you know and maybe this is a, a trap that that we talked about earlier in terms of mistakes is like going too deep down the rabbit warren and going like you know and his second daughter was named this and she went to college over in this oh, yeah. day, blah, blah 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 obviously not not necessary yeah. but there's that that concept in filmmaking of you know the film extends beyond the four edges of the screen and you feel like you're just kind of like immersed in a world rather than you know capturing a very specific uh kind of setup um, and I think having, you know, tavern names that mean something to the people there, um, whether it's tied to heraldry or the tavern owner or the location does help the world feel a little bit more real than if the DM's like, oh, I don't know, the tavern's called um, the Rusty tavern Bucket, Ale whatever. House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. I firmly believe that if you're writing extra past what is needed for the players, you're writing it for yourself. Never sure. write it to show off. Never write yeah. it with the expectation of other people seeing it and going, yay, because it's for you. That's what that's what you give yourself when you're writing these things. Yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. Um, so we touched on this a little bit already, but um, what about things like tavern music and ambience? Is this something you should be thinking about when you're create, creating the tavern or when you're putting the tavern for for play for for your players to interact with? I think a bit of both is good. It, it, like we've been saying, don't overdo it before you're playing, but add, add some flair while you're playing. So I think to have a general idea of what kind of stuff might float through the air um, is, is a good note to start with. And then when mm -hmm. the players walk in, figure out what, what is floating through the air. Yeah. I think it really helps set the mood and and a bit of expectation around the tavern when the players are walking in um, and this can be subverted as well if it's a small log hall that's at a small village again that the tavern might not even have a name maybe it's silent in there or maybe there's one bard in there that's kind of like you know maybe maybe it's a local from the village who's just standing in the corner and kind of singing a cappella um the the barefaced liar always had something a different act on every night so i'd be like you know it's a full brass band and they're like going absolute hand when you walk in tonight or it's just one kid and he's like reading beat poetry from this little leather book because um, it's a tuesday exactly exactly <laughs> nobody's in um whether it's the broken leg had a bard who there who was one of the sort of early villains of that campaign who played a a um a liar, I think it is, or the little, the little, no, it was like a, um, what do you call it with the string and the bow violin. and the violin. Thank you. Um, she played a violin oh. and she played it quite chaotically and she played it quite aggressively. And so, you know, I'd always describe when you walk into this tavern, there's it's very dark around the place except for this one area where there's a lot of light where there's this one bard who's just going like you can hear the music as you approach and it's it's this high pitched very fast paced violin music mm -hmm. um and when you walk in you can see everybody's watching her like thumping the tables in time with her playing her music and uh, you know hopefully it kind of sets the players a little like it's it almost feels aggressive coming into this bar you know the music's like gonna it punches you in the face when the door opens and you hear it full force as opposed to when you're hearing it from outside and from outside it's a warning bell it's like don't approach any closer um because this is frantic this is a place of shifting uh, unpredictability um so you can definitely set the mood a lot with the sort of music yeah. that you're going to choose to to represent and in the tavern the music I definitely helps with narrative direction i mm. think when you walk in it's very much where is that coming from mm. and then you can kind of ask and answer the question is the bard playing for the patrons are they playing for money or are they playing for their own heart because mm. then the focus shifts oh they're singing for themselves who is this person? And if they're playing for the bar, it's like, oh, this place is singing itself. That's really cool. Mm. I think that um, what you both touched on there, and again, I'm, I'm pulling pulling something out of my writing pocket, <laughs> is um, is characterization. And characterization yeah. isn't just for NPCs. Characterization is also for locations. Exactly. Mm. Um, and I think that whenever you're writing these kinds of details, 
Again, I'm a firm proponent of bullet points. I think bullet points are the way to write world yeah. building unless you're presenting it to other people in like a beautiful mm. article or something. It, it, it always devolves into bullet points when you're writing for a campaign. <laughs> you start yeah. with these massive documents and then it comes into one oh, page. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think any world building like that should should yeah. be bullet points for two reasons. A, you're not losing time writing it, but B, you're not losing time passing it when you need vital information. And mm. you're not answering questions that haven't been asked yet. Boom. Yeah, Easy. exactly. But yeah, I think really digging into characterization, which is what you you've both sort of been been talking about, essentially, it, it, this characterization of location is so important. I actually mm. go further. Um, I, I always write about smells. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because they're really evocative. So mm. I like to write about um, what you see, obviously, and I think that's what everyone focuses on. But if it's like a tavity tavern that's tavern flavored, um, and I haven't put a lot of effort into, okay, and the chairs are made of crafted seashells and the bar is a, you know, a, a whale skeleton that's been like, I don't Smells know, like crystallized fish. in resin or something. <laughs> um, if I haven't gone there, then I will go to, okay, it smells like sawdust and sweat, or it smells like yeah. lavender and fresh bread. You know, like- very like... much the author speaking. That is oh yeah, absolutely. A, a narrative thing. But I feel like it's such a great way to, to set up the player's expectations. Okay, mm. like I don't have to say, this is a really nice place. I can say this smells like lavender and bread uh, and the sure. curtains are made of velvet and they, they've got it. Yeah. It's that sort of um, show don't tell style thing, you know, where instead of saying, ah, this place seems a bit seedy, you're like, you know, when you walk in here, it smells like blood and ale, which, you know, yeah, instantly please. indicates that fighting and, and different things yeah. happen in here. We're yeah. just very quick sidebar. I totally want to have a place now called Tavity Tavern. And it's just <laughs> like, the least creative bartender who just caught, he's like, I don't know what to call it. I just called it Tavity Tavern. And it, everybody loves Tavity Tavern. They love on a Thursday night, Tavity Tavern is the place to be. And the menu is just like bread, yeah. ale. Yeah, 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 exactly. Bed, you know. Yeah, room, big room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> big room, oh, little room. This. <laughs> yeah no 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 big uh you know like the 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 lord's just, suite and the yeah, ladies it's, suite no, no, and no, the, that. it's like template tavern just the, yeah. laziest thing ever. <laughs> the they're not paying me enough to write this <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah smells like tavern looks like tavern there's a lot of taverny sort of people hanging out food in here like tavern food yeah exactly Bartender if you lick the wall like tastes like tavern, tastes like tavern. <laughs> So what about adventure hooks? I feel like we should get away from the tavern tavern. What about adventure hooks in taverns? Like, do you have any recommendations for weaving taverns into the adventure themselves, either at the start of the adventure, which is of course the typical one, or in the middle of the adventure? Uh, that's not something I've thought about, but I do, I, I really think that there is kind of, if you look at it from a really abstract perspective, there is no beginning and end to any adventure. So when there is a hook, so right the, now. the players are entering the story that is already being told. So the person who is there is there for a reason. They came there from somewhere else that pertains to where the players are about to go. So start thinking about not so much. Uh, it's more of a focus on kind of Ben's style where you, you focus on this person and how interesting they are, what like why they're wearing this cloak. Maybe they have sigils from a, a distant land. And you're like, how did you get here? And then you sort of paint this person as, oh, that guy has a lot of history, which means there's a lot. History is just the past of a story. So if it's continuing, mm -hmm. he is a part of a big story and the players just kind of get introduced. I like that. Yeah, it depends on whether the, um, you, you can definitely weave the, the tavern in. And I don't know if I've ever sort of thought about this separately, but again, just drawing on examples from past campaigns I've run where I've tried to make the tavern um, more part of the tale. Um, you know, the, the, the idea between the, the barefaced liar and the broken leg to bring those two up again is that there was almost a, a rivalry between them. Not so much that the tavern owners didn't like each other, but just in terms of like all the wealthy, well-to-do people went and hung out at the barefaced liar. And you had this guy who was kind of like the financial king of the city. He wasn't the Lord. He wasn't the ruler, but everybody kind of paid lip service to him. And he was the one who had bodyguards around him. And on the flip side, the broken leg was where all the kind of like more underbelly thieves guild kind of people uh, like to hang out. 
And so, you know, the party had repeated reasons to return to both taverns because they either had to talk to um, those two individuals or those two groups of people, um, or you had one group invade the other tavern. You know, they came and to, to take that safe haven away from the party. If they aggravate one group over the other too much, maybe something happens where one tavern gets raided by the other group. Um, also having taverns that, you know, are... Uh, uh, I think a lot of villages probably, you know, this is me kind of speculating a little bit, but a lot of villages probably start with, you know, it's a way house. It's a, it's a place of safety um, where travelers can stop on the road and it just starts as this single building between towns. And then over time, you know, families move in, people get stuck at the tavern. And so they build themselves a house out in the woods somewhere. And this village kind of grows up over time. So the tavern has a history within the village that extent yeah. that may not be immediately obvious and extends beyond just being the the ale house um there was that one is. tavern that i ran that was kind of more of a hotel and the idea was that it was run by these three fey sisters that um had uh, that were the descendants of hags that lived out in the woods that the party could go interact with Wait, but it off. meant that there were clues about the surrounding area oh, in the tavern in the tapestries and the sorts of flowers that were in and creepy things would happen in the tavern at night when the party were trying a long rest that would um, kind of indicate that there was more going on here than just um uh, what was what was going on um really good. you know out there i uh, love the that idea- the yeah, idea that Logan. we started with was really interesting because that is kind of historically accurate. Uh, I recently got a little bit into homebrewing and I'm learning like ancient historical water just tasted bad all the time. It was disgusting. <laughs> so what people would do, the, the reason that we all have massive amounts of alcohol today is because that's what they would use to mask the taste. So you would start, um, it's basically just kind of like grain tea. So they would boil the tea in it. You have these jobs like alewives, which eventually became witches. But it, it all starts with just um, the idea of, okay, we need food and water. This is the place mm. that has food and water and bedding. Mm. And it has something that's a little better than, you know, wild water. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of early early beer was almost like porridge. It was like fermented yeah, porridge. Yeah, uh, small like beer. Chewy, exactly. And it's yeah. like one or 2%. So they would just feed yeah. it to kids. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I didn't think I liked beer these days, but I definitely don't think I would have liked a medieval beer. Small beer is nasty. Yeah, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, we we should be very grateful that they developed the <laughs> developed the process further filtration process. <laughs> uh, I'm really glad that you brought up the idea of um of NPCs and taverns and and information gathering because I think that's something particularly if you're playing a city campaign. So if you're playing a like you get a quest, you go off to the dungeon, you kill some undead and you get some treasure the end huzzah that's fine but when you're doing a, a, a city quest uh eberron for example is is full of these kinds of ideas taverns are a great place to f- gather information get mm. rumors these kinds of things if you're doing more intrigue if you're doing more social um you know taverns are such a great setting for that and i think those are the moments where you do want to build out your tavern more if it's just you meet in a tavern you're leaving by don't let the door hit you on in the ass on the way out that's one thing mm. but if it's mm. like you're going to this tavern repeatedly because you need to ask all these people questions and the way that the tavern is affects the way that scene will play out then it's worth putting a little bit more time into your tavern, right? Like it mm. becomes a key location. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if, if you want it to be a place that requires exploration, that there's secrets in the tavern owner's room and and they need to go and um, investigate, uh, you know, they need to break into their room and they, you know, or maybe they need to go down into the cellar because this, this tavern literally has skeletons in its closet. Mm. Um, you can almost map out a tavern like a dungeon if you if you really yeah. wanted to and and do. have like all the separate rooms. Yeah, exactly. That's mm-hmm. that, that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, a great example from literature is the Prancing Pony at the beginning of Lord of the Rings, mm-hmm. where you know about the Prancing Pony because stuff happens there. There's a really important letter from Gandalf. There's a really important NPC. Mm-hmm. And you know what? The beds that the hobbits were supposed to be sleeping in get stabbed. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's lots of details that are really important for later in the story. Um, the difference, of course, between literature and RPG games is you can't always tell what your MC- MCs, your PCs are going to do. So um, obviously, like, there is this potential there with taverns, I think, to be a key part of the adventure. But uh, it's harder to bet on it, basically. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, we will very soon be getting to your audience questions. But in the meantime, let's talk tavern games. Another thing that The Witcher really brought to the fore, Gwent, of course. <laughs> but uh, people have been playing tavern games, you know, since there were people in taverns. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of video games have, have really leaned into the idea of tavern games, mini games, this sure. kind of thing. What's your opinion on those? I think it's a nice respite from, you know, the, the, the terror of the adventure and all the trauma that characters go through is to just sit down and play something that is inconsequential in the grand scheme, maybe make some yeah. money for another meal. But I think in D&D &D and in role playing games, it almost never fits because you literally stop playing D&D &D and you start yeah. playing something else. So I think it can easily be a problem. Yeah. But it's cool you, narratively. Ben? Yeah, I don't disagree. Um, uh, the one tavern game, I think I might have come up with this, or I, if I, I, it's possible I pulled it from the internet somewhere or slightly changed it. But the idea was basically it was like blackjack with dice with d6s. So you would roll them and you're trying to get as close to 20 or 21 as possible. And you get to choose whether you want to like roll another dice if you don't think you've rolled high enough with your initial three dice. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it was fine. Players liked it to some capacity. It, almost every time a player played it, they tried to cheat, um, which of I course. always just found funny. Yeah, it's just like, all right, slide of hand check. No, you didn't pass. Now you're in trouble. What do you think was going to happen? <laughs> do you know what I love um, about that? That actually brings Logan's problem back because you are now role playing yeah. in the yeah, mini game. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and totally. that's totally yeah. where I go with this. So, oh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. When I do mini games, I do things like, okay, arm wrestling, strength check, yeah, uh, yeah, darts, sure. dexterity check. Yeah. Um, and then players can bet on them. And, it, you know, if mm. somebody starts to do well, like all the other NPCs will come around and they'll start to run a betting rig and maybe they'll try mm. and cheat and then they'll be run out of the tavern. There's all these social shenanigans that you can really dig into, um, well, which is yeah. what I love about mini games. What I hate about mini games is exactly what Logan said, which is like, right, guys. We were playing D and D. Now apparently we're playing cards. And I that guess. Yeah, works for sure. very well in video games because mm. you're just playing a game. So like, oh, yeah, sure. stop. Let, let's play Hearthstone for a little bit. But like, no, <laughs> if you're sitting, Gwent and play D &D, is not yeah. Hearthstone. <laughs> I know. Gwent is amazing. <laughs> I mean, like Red Dead. There's a million different games that you can just stop and play for that piece. Sure. But D and D, I think for a lot of people, kind of is the tavern game to avoid their own like life problems and stuff. So it don't want to get yeah, too I, meta, too many layers down. I think that um I think that I that I ultimately agree and don't tend to play that dice game as much anymore. But what I will tend to do, especially if players have proficiency with gaming uh, you know, kits, dragon chess or dice cards, whatever it happens to be, is when they go into a tavern, if they're looking for information, um, maybe they get proficiency on a charisma check if they sit down to play dice with the local mm -hmm. person who's playing dice because they know how, you know, they might not, they might not have proficiency in insight because they didn't take insight for whatever reason. Maybe they're a fighter, but they not, not that fighters can't take insight. Um, but they know that like, you know, they know how to read people's tells when they're playing cards. And so that makes it easier for them to tell when somebody's lying to them in the context of a card game because they're trying to like, you know, uh, plug them for information or, or, or needle them for information at the yeah. same time as this person's trying to bluff them. Um, so using, you know, not, not so much going into a mini game, but going into um, an extension of the rules of fifth yes. edition that are already there providing um you know in set mechanical incentives to the players based on yeah, choices think, that they might have made i think that really does solve the problem is making it like a test treating it yeah. like combat mm. we are mm. fighting this character for information like i um currently am working on a video about sphinxes and to solve a riddle a riddle is not dnd &D. it's something abstract but you need to figure it out in order to progress so if you go to a tavern and you have to stop everything and pull out like I forgot that I invented a card game for Twisted Taverns. Like if you have to beat this guy in a card game in order to get that information, you are playing D and D. Yeah. So mm. I think that's a cool a cool workaround. One of the mm. things that I like to add is what I call an explosive pass. So if it's necessary for the story, there should be a way to break the deadlock, even if they can't get through. I do this for like traps sure. and locked yeah. doors and all sorts. So um, either the door just explodes after a certain amount of tampering <laughs> with and you get d6 damage but you can continue or somebody opens it from the inside and it's a guard and you get into combat and everybody's alerted so you get a penalty but still sure. it doesn't stop the story and i think yeah. with what you're talking about again there should there should always be and it 
the explosive pass, the thing that ups the stakes and gives you some penalty, but at least it doesn't stop you from moving forward with the plot. Mm -hmm. I, like I think that. the so other, like, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, lose, Logan. He says, you know, either you can challenge me again, and I'll take this thing from you, or I'll take something much bigger, and then I'll just tell you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think the other thing that uh, gambling does in any tavern, um, as as a sort of shorthand to use a Dale Kingsmill expression, is that anytime there's uh, gambling in a tavern, the party are like, oh yeah, this is a dive bar. Like th there's bad people here. <laughs> it's a trope tell. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. If there's gambling in this tavern, this is where we know the seedy people hang out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And that's where we can find our fence or our dude is yes. running from the law yeah, or yeah. whatever else yeah yeah absolutely anything that's yeah. that's like that it's like alarm alarm i tried to tell you something as a gm <laughs> exactly um awesome okay i have more questions but of course i must do the audience questions so let's have a look what is the one thing that all taverns should have even if they're very exclusive or hidden from a typical traveler a front door <laughs> I, I don't agree. I don't agree. Oh. Uh, only because I've got a tavern in a game I'm running at the moment. And the idea is that it's just open air. Like it's just like oh. a collection of tables that are kind of like collected together in this village where there's a bunch of <laughs> ancient broken down ruins and they just use the, the foundations of these old houses as fighting pits uh, yeah. to, to punch each other in the face. So front door. Uh, uh, you know what, what else then? You I'll step back and I'll say a living front door. The person who introduces you to the sure. tavern. So hey, you can either okay, have yep. the person who gives you the invitation and meets you there. You have the bartender. You have the barmaid who asks for your drink and gives you the info. You need the one person who is the living, like the body form of the tavern, essentially. Mm. Mm. I would say, I'm going to go meta and say a reason for being there. Yeah. Like, that, like don't, just, don't just make it on spec. Like, know you can... why it's there. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Because you can say things like, "This is where the you know, this is where they pick up quests," or "This is you know, so it needs a quest board or a notice board, or it needs like yeah. places to be given quests." But I don't think that's even necessarily yeah, I, true I if the tavern is. That. But you Sorry? can really, you can just beat me in any angle on that because if I say, "Well, you don't need a reason to be there," then you're there to find a reason. Like, there's always something that can happen at a tavern. So just to have something. It's yeah, substance, mm. really is kind of what we're boiling down. All right, mm. great question here from Wingding. How would you incorporate taverns in a very wilderness-based game? Ooh, I have some thoughts on this, but I want to hear yours. Uh, safe houses, um, uh, you know, places that, that that the party can rest that are there specifically. Maybe you have a network of safe houses that kind of go through the wilderness. Um, the idea in Grim Hollow is that, like, if you rest in the woods, you are probably going to get attacked. So you mm. need to have these safe houses that network on the roads. But if it's something that's like a complete wilderness, like um, uh, like Tomb of Annihilation, if you're if you're traveling around Cholton, that's like a complete like there's no civilization here. Re you know. Mm sort of um i've done things like have uh you know hermits that you know it's not a tavern it's a but it's hermits that are like living in the middle of the wilderness or i had uh like this little uh i don't know where i got the monster stat block from but it was like this little fey creature that was kind of weird and looked like a cross between a crab and a fairy it was a weird thing but I just basically decided that this thing was a traveling merchant through the wilderness and it had a dinosaur as its pack animal. So just kind of that, that's not so much a tavern, but the idea was that, um, you know, there's weird versions of things that exist in the wilderness that may not be civilized, but they serve the same function um, as a, as a tavern. Yeah. Logan. That's more, that's more or less what I was going to say is just have something that serves the same, like the three bullet points you need, a safe place you need a place to gather information and you need a place where something can happen that is unexpected and yeah, i think absolutely. a hermitage like going to meet yoda and having porridge with yoda <laughs> in like a swamp that counts as a tavern experience because you're you're coming to this place where the owner of this place is welcoming you yeah absolutely providing for you and providing information so i would add I, oh, go ahead ben I was just going to say military camps also add like a, like some sort of encampment. Cause I know yeah. Cholt has a bunch of um, like the camp vengeance and camp, yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So those can act as like little um, villages, especially if the, if the military have been stuck there for a long time, they've developed a, a little community around the, their encampment. Yeah. And I would add uh, nomads. Nomads are so useful. 
you know what? If your players are dying and they desperately need a long rest, they can find a trail <laughs> that needs to, leads to some nomads and they can get a long rest in safety, some food, some drink. They might have to buy it. Do you know what? That's a tavern. Um, yeah. It's yeah, really, really idea. useful and it's a great way. You know, again, there can be NPC interactions. There's all sorts of stuff you can do, but um, it, it just gives you gives your players that respite, you know, if mechanically yeah. they need it or emotionally they need it. Uh, I had a game mm -hmm. where a character got both hands chopped off, not my character, but an NPC, um, and all the players just went, oh my god. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I had to get the players somewhere that they could like process this because yeah. they were freaking out. Um, and again, like it's not always mechanical. It's not always a long rest. Sometimes people need just that, that little downtime break. That, they need that's exactly like it. Them. Yeah, yeah. That's why I introduced that Fay Magic Merchant was just because like you know the way that I run Chult is is like a meat grinder. Like it's hard and the jungles suck and there's undead everywhere and there's no safe harbor and you know all that like the yeah. jungle itself's trying to kill you. And I was like, we we'll have a big. Magic Fame Merchant, you know, just to make, just to have a session where they can just shop for some things because yeah. they've got all this gold and nothing to do with it. Yeah, this was my problem when we did Avenus. So we did Avenus for the D and D um, channel. Um, right. And so it was 12 episodes of Avenus. It wasn't even a long campaign because it was it was all like 12 episodes, two hours, all on show. Mm -hmm. But we got to episode six and I was like, man, I hate Avenus. I hate Avenus. <laughs> I hate this place. And it's you're supposed to hate it. It's supposed yeah. to be awful. Like Chult yeah. is supposed to be awful. But your players get to a point. It's not even the characters because the characters can suck yeah. it but the players get to a point where they're just like yes. man i hate this place so much you need to give them a little bit of a refresher so that they can go back and enjoy the the drama of it without just the soul sucking right that, that's why i like the nomads idea is because as a dm sometimes you can feel weirdly stuck even though you can make up anything you want you can say there's a tavern in the wilderness if you want a tavern to be in the wilderness but if it doesn't make sense for your campaign you can feel like ah they're kind of what do i do here and so just having a, a, you know a, a grab bag of ideas which we're kind of generating here of things that you can throw out uh, if the party gets stuck in that sort of situation um even if they're again like not uh, a humanoid race, even if it's like a, a you know nomadic kobolds who are moving through some uh, underdark caves and they're not particularly aggressive, uh, they could be friendly to the NPCs or the PCs, yeah. I should say. Yeah, absolutely. And again, friendly under certain certain circumstances. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's the yeah. other thing. Like they don't have to be altruistic. You can pay yeah. them for stuff. <laughs> Um, one more question here from ECC Books. Very interesting. Is there a type of tavern you've seen playing RPGs that you wish you saw more often in literature and films or games or whatever else you like? That's a tough um, question. Luxury taverns. I, I'm a weird like dude in terms of like, I really love floor plans. I don't know why. Like I just really love real estate and floor plans. And when I see like a really luxurious tavern the the like shepherd's apartment in uh, mass effect three i'm just like this is a nice apartment and when i go into a tavern and it's like really nice if it's in like some treetops or i go into the the place where you're meant to sleep and i'm like this is a nice room i would sleep in this room you know having some like real upmarket luxury tree the luxury hotel space of the exactly. D, D world exactly I, love it. I feel like you don't get enough of those I, love I it. would want to say roaming taverns, ones Ooh. that you find by yeah. chance. And I think oh, not like taverns on chicken legs, which was instant. No, but I like that idea too. It, it, it kind of both is what I mean. Like we have a train, we have a submarine, we have um, a, a break in reality that just shatters what you're looking at and there's a door there. Like things that just, I, I need to know why this is here and where it's mm. going and maybe I want to go too. It's, whoa, just stuff like that. Surprise. That's really awesome. I love that. And now we need Amazon chicken legs, Logan. Has to happen. Mm. <laughs> book two. We know what's going to be in there. We got huts in book three. We got huts. Um, all right. I have a shout out for Sorda 1984 or Sw Order or S Worder. I never know with, with Twitch names. It could be anybody. Sorder. Sorder. Sorder 1984. If you are here, please say something to claim your Eldritch Foundry Mini which you have won. Congratulations. Ooh. And that is my signal for the very final question. What's next for you guys? Uh, uh, well, I mean, we've got, you know, Sunken Isles going right now, and that's maybe got a week left. 
And mm-hmm. after that, I'm going to learn how to breathe. <gasps> I've heard break. of this thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've really lost touch with the ability to do that in recent years, and it's getting harder and harder. So I'm going to give that to me. But oh, after that, I, that. I, I, I am planning um, a book, uh, a sequel to Stibbles that is, I think I'm going with uh, Stibbles Menagerie of Mounts. Ooh, I love that. Horses, you know, the the first thing that came to mind when I was thinking, like just brainstorming for the book um, is in the original, the Dark Crystal movie, there are these things called land striders that are just the weirdest creatures ever. And Do you know that I just wrote the Dark Crystal RPG? No. I just wrote the Dark Crystal RPG. That's well, the, the last big project that I did. So yes, Landstrider is intimately familiar with. So I've cool. in, I've invented some little cousins of them as well with weird tentacle That's faces. Awesome. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was like, what what do we need? More Landstriders. Small Landstriders. Mm. Tentacle faced Landstriders. So yes, <laughs> Landstriders. I know them. Tell me more. Awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we've got the Twi- uh, I was about to say Twisted Taverns. No, that was that was a while ago. We got the Sunken Isles. Uh, so Twisted yeah. Taverns arriving now. Sunken Isles yeah. Kickstarter on uh, at the moment. Um, over yeah, it's kind of weird doing like working yeah. on Kickstarters because you kind of exist in two. Speaking of being in the future, you kind of it's exist in two out. time frames <laughs> where um, you know everybody's really excited about taverns at the moment because they're all getting it in their hands, which is awesome. And we're mm-hmm. also thinking about Sunken Isles because that's the Kickstarter that's currently awesome. going. Um, and then, yeah, for me personally, uh, just kind of ramping things up on the Ghostfire Gaming YouTube channel. Uh, I like talking about D&D, so I'm going to be doing a lot more of that uh, and nice. filming myself doing it. So, um, yeah. And, yeah. Very exciting. Well, folks, um, I know that the links are being thrown in there for where you can find Logan on his YouTube channel and Ben on the Ghostfire Gaming YouTube channel. So if you want to hear more of their wisdom, then uh, go and check them out. And maybe, just maybe, they'll come back and talk to us again sometime. What do you reckon, guys? I would love to. I wouldn't mind at all. Boom. Yeah. There we go. I got it on camera. Has to happen. <laughs> well, Mike Beans, that is all we have time for today. So I want to thank you all very, very much for being here, for your amazing questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through them all. There were so very many of them. And of course, a massive thank you too for all of your generosity. Drunken Panda, Tillers, Satrium, Stiltis, the cartographer Elysium, and of course, Eldritch Foundry for that wonderful Eldritch Foundry mini, Ghostfire Gaming for being here today, and Logan as well. Um, just a reminder that question of the week, very apt considering what we're talking about today, is how much world building is too much world building. And we're going to be discussing that tomorrow on the stage over on our Discord, the same time that this started. And uh, just finally, we are going on a raid. Our raid shout is a light up the fork. So shout it out as we go raid Mendari and let her know that we sent you. All right, Beans, we will be back next week for more of uh, interviews and streams. We're going to be doing challenge discussion. We're going to be uh, talking about all of the exciting developments that are coming out in World Anvil and uh, all the stuff we do in the community as well. So check out next week. And in the meantime, grab your hammer and go world build. Bye.